morning. <clears throat> My voice is a little bit weak this morning, and so I may have to sip on some water. But um, slept good last night. I have to say I approve of Oregon. It's nice here. I can't wait to hit the Pacific Coast Highway. Not this trip. Next trip. That means you got to invite me back, Justin. So um, uh, hopefully that's in the cards. Um, but um, just a pleasure to be with you. I think one of the things that it's just like, kind of like icing on the cake. I love doing what I get to do, um, like entering into people's lives and and um, getting to, to hear their stories and, and then run to Jesus together. I mean, like, I get paid to do this. I can't believe I get paid to do this. Um, but I think one of the, the, the extra benefits um, that, that I love is, is getting to go and work with churches um, all over the place um, and getting to see huh, that we have family all over the world. <laughs> um, and so getting to be here and see what the Lord's doing um, in this area with with new brothers and sisters that I'm getting to meet, um, knowing that it's a foreshadow of what's to come when we get to be in glory together as a family, um, not because we've earned anything, but because God's that good, <laughs> and he's made a way for us to be brought into his family and adopted in, so so um, I love you. You're stuck with me. I love you. We're going to be in heaven together, and so it's, it's always good to meet brothers and sisters and be reminded um, that the Lord is building his church. All right, go to Matthew 6, Matthew 6. So by way of recap, last night we spent most of our time um, in Matthew 22, and and we read the words of Jesus, called the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Second is like it, love others, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we talked about the implications of the vertical, and that we were created uh, with a one vertical capacity limit on our heart. That's it. You got, you, got, you got bandwidth for, for one vertical relationship, and that's with um, the God of the heavens, the God of the universe, the one true God uh, alone. That's it. That's, it. That's, that's the only vertical relationship our heart has capacity for. And, and then out of the overflow of that relationship, which is what we were created for, in essence, it's worship to commune with him, affections and, and, and our passions terminate perfectly there. We have the ability to enter into the horizontal. We see our right, ourselves in right perspective, meaning pride's in check, and it's replaced by humility, and we see others in right perspective, and, and Christ didn't come to serve, but to, didn't come to be served, but to serve, and that we're about other people more than we're about ourselves. That's in theory, right? That's the way God intended it to be. Sin has unbelievably fractured that whole dynamic. And in the vertical being fractured, it means the fallout is all the horizontal is fractured. And, and if you weren't here last night, I had a big whiteboard up here. And, and so you, you may have to go and talk to somebody who was here to, to get the illustration. But the illustration was, was pretty simple. Just, just out, of, out, out of the heart flows all things. We looked at Matthew 15. That's the theology of the heart. That, that we have these dynamics called fruit in our lives. They're the outworkings, Right? And I talked about people coming to counseling, like people come to counseling with fruit issues. They come to counseling because they have addiction problems or anxiety problems or depression problems, relationship problems, and, and those are horizontal, right? All of them are horizontal. They're the outworkings of something deeper going on inside, though. And it's not that Jesus doesn't care about the fruit. He does. He cares deeply about your hurt. He cares deeply about your brokenness. He cares deeply about your struggles. So much so he drives it right to the source of where all of those things manifest. The heart. That's how committed God is to us as he's redeeming us through Jesus Christ. He's saving us from the inside out. That he's far less interested in your morals. He wants your heart. Because when he has your heart and the gospel takes hold of your heart, guess how it affects everything you do? It changes your motives. It changes your desires. As the gospel takes root, as your identity is firmed up in Christ, and Christ is that sure foundation, now it drives me to live differently. And I love sacrificially because Jesus loved me sacrificially. I express compassion because Jesus has compassion for me. It's flipped the script, and now out of, out of a spiritual act of worship, because my heart's been changed, the gospel rearranges everything and fuels why I do what I do. And this has to be the basis, I would contend for all relationships, especially marriage. There is, and what we'll see today is, um, we're going to be all over the scriptures. 
Um, I'm going to try to not preach the sermon I'm supposed to preach tomorrow because I'm preaching out of Ephesians 5 tomorrow, but I will touch on a couple things from Ephesians because it's, it's a famous passage about um, marriage, but we're going to look at lots of different verses, and, and, and the, the title of this talk is Common Reasons Marriage, Marriage is Struggle. And we'll see Matthew 6 is going to help us understand some dynamics that trip us up relationally. Matthew 6, verse 19. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It's about halfway through the Sermon on the Mount. It comes right after um, Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray the Lord's Prayer. It says this in verse 19 of chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See the heart language? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. It seems to be that Jesus is kind of all over the place, but he's not. This is the greatest sermon that was ever written, okay? And Jesus is preaching that sermon to many people who've gathered to hear him. And and the, the first reason marriages can struggle is because they become hopefully horizontal and self-centered and there's some aspects of that hopeless horizontal disposition that comes from the self-ruled heart remember the 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 basic the basic components of uh the 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 heart that's full of sin pride and what idolatry that 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 you can boil everything down from a fruit issue to two fundamental heart dynamics that you and i interact with in our flesh and it boils down to pride and idolatry. And then we talked about the two basic responses from a self-ruled heart, lust and fear. Remember that? That lust, don't think sexual appetite. Lust is more uh, uh, understood as covet, to covet something. Which means it's a, the, when I'm walking in self-rule, when I'm walking in pride from my heart, and, and, and lust is one of the manifestations of that, it's, it's a control to obtain. And, and the control is the pride because I'm, I'm entrusting my provision to myself rather than looking to the Lord. And, and it's also a critique on God's provision for me. God's giving me everything I need. If I don't have it, clearly he thinks I don't need it. And the covetous heart says, you know what, God? I really want that. I don't really like what you've given me. And so in my pride, I go and make it happen. How arrogant is that? That's pride. That's the control. And then the fearful heart. The fearful heart is controlled to protect. So there's these, there's these dynamics of the heart that I believe were woven in in Genesis 1 and 2 before sin entered the world that are still dynamics of all human hearts. They've just been flawed profoundly by sin. So things like security. You know why you like security? Because God wove it into your soul to want it. You know where you find it perfectly? Jesus. You know where we seek it most often? All kinds of places. Anybody like peace? Who who just loves chaos all the time? Because if you do, I can diagnose you real quick. I mean, by and large, people don't prefer chaos. You know why? Because God wove peace into your soul. (laughs) You know who the author of peace is? Jesus. You know where we look for peace most often? Well, for me, it's my OCD tendencies when everything's cleaned up at the house. Four kids war against that all the time. I actually just gave that up a couple years ago. I'm just like, meth lab it is. <laughs> Sorry. I just learned that that's not illegal here, so that's... It's troubling. It's troubling. Pretty sure I smelled some downtown when I was walking around last night, so... All right, I need to get back on topic. That there's these dynamics of the heart that God's woven into us, sin has fractured those things. And and when we find our relationship vertically with the Lord and and we're resting there and we're abiding there and we're worshiping there, things like peace and security, I find them in Him alone. 
And if, and if he gives me a sense of peace through my relationship with my wife, it doesn't terminate on her. It's a gift from the Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is such a great relationship, but ultimately you're my peace. It always flows vertically. Sin pushes that out consistently. And so here's four things that we see in this hopelessly horizontal and self-centered perspective. The first is three kingdoms in conflict. So why do marriages struggle? Three kingdoms in conflict. What are those three kingdoms? We actually get this kingdom language from verse 10 in chapter 6 when Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray. In verse 10 he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember the throne we drew and I said that C.S. Lewis described the heart as a, a God-shaped vacuum that God perfectly sets on the throne of our hearts? His kingdom will have no end and he's redeemed us into his kingdom. It's the only kingdom that's eternal. It's the only kingdom that matters. And we can't get into his kingdom unless by grace he redeems us and he does that through Jesus Christ and we're drawn into his kingdom. But when I'm living in a prideful way, when I default to pride, guess who's, who jumps on the throne of my heart? Lee does. And, and I really like and drawn to jump on that throne. You are too. And, and when I jump on that throne, I'm now about my kingdom. So you're now a means to an end for me. Better cooperate. You better do what I say. And in the moment you stop, and I said this last night, I'll punish you. I'll punish you. I either remove myself from the relationship or I move on to greener pastures, to what's better for me, what better serves my kingdom. Well, now let's just put a d- dynamic together. You got one sinner who loves his kingdom, me. You got my wife who, who lives for her kingdom and her flesh, and we're called to live for his kingdom. That's the three kingdoms in conflict. So the fight I told you about at the end of the, the sermon last night with my wife, that, 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 that dynamic early in our marriage that was causing great gridlock for us relationally, a lot of kingdoms in conflict there. And I didn't even get into my, 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 my wife's stuff. Some stuff that she was dealing with. And marriage just takes sanctification and turns it like to a 10 immediately. There's a great book you ought to read. Um, It's by a guy named Gary Thomas. Uh, It's called Sacred Marriage. And the tagline of the book is worth it alone. What if God created marriage for your holiness, not your happiness? (laughs) You know why that is? Because it reveals faulty allegiances in my heart very quickly. The things I told you about last night that were going on in my heart relationally towards my wife the insecurities the wounds the fears i'd been carrying some of those i can go all the way back to like six or seven years old and i can see them i'd been carrying those my whole life and didn't see it till i had another sinner that i was married to and now it's like in my face and and everything in me wanted to just blame her but then god starts to point the arrow at me and this was, was so gracious about our god like he doesn't waste anything Like he'll use a a knockdown drag out of a fight to reveal allegiances that are misplaced in me because he's coming after those. That's how committed he is to me. And in humbling me and bringing me back under his kingdom, I can now go and be a peacemaker towards my wife. These are the three kingdoms in conflict. It's his agenda, her agenda, and God's agenda. God's calling us to submit to his agenda, to his kingdom. Second, you see it in verses 19 through 21. Treasures... And pleasures. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where there no moth or no rust can destroy. No thieves do not break in and steal. So, this picture of, of treasures and pleasures, think of it like this it's the temporal versus the eternal. Like if you're living for the now, like if, if, if relationships, if pursuits, if ambitions, if your drive is, is for the now, the temporal, like all that's going to burn, all of it. And, and let's just be honest, some of the Christmas gifts that you got this year, they're already in a landfill probably. Like everything's phasing out. Like I finally got... AirPods, like first generation ones, because I can't afford the new ones. And, and my, my, my boys already make fun of me, like, ah, oh, you got the old ones. I'm like, okay, all right. You know, it's like everything's always phasing out. It's temporal. 
And here's the thing about identity. When your identity is in Christ and that, that bedrock, that foundation is informing how you see, you're not at the mercy of all the temporal needs that, that are pining for your attention, that our flesh so craves and feels like we have to have. It puts it all in perspective. That's what Jesus is saying here, that part of the reason we get hopelessly horizontal in our marriages is because we're, we're too focused on the, the pleasures here rather than acknowledging that he is stored for us in heaven an inheritance that is unfading, undefiled, and nothing can touch it. That's how rock solid you, yours and mine's salvation is in Jesus Christ. Like we're affected by the groaning of a fallen world. We're squeezed by the realities that we're not in glory yet. Like creation groans, the scriptures say. But, but the salvation we have in Christ is so rock solid that there's this inheritance waiting for me that strengthens me right now. First Peter describes it as a living hope. This living hope is, is confident looking towards what, what has been secured for us in Jesus Christ and it's strengthened progressively and daily as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Like it's not just something far off. That strengthens me today. That changes how you live. This is why Paul's able to say some outlandish things at different places. In Philippians he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know what he's saying? I mean, they're always trying to kill Paul. He got stoned to death a couple times and didn't die. Imprisoned, beaten. And he's like, oh yeah, you, you want to kill me? Man, that's like, I'll, I'll go be in glory with Jesus. Oh, you're going to let me live? Yeah, I'm going to keep preaching. What do you do with that guy? You know why? Because he's looking to eternity. These, these silly things that we get so pulled into, whew, it's just, it just, they come and go. I mean, how freed up would we be if the pleasures of this world, this world didn't have such a grip on our heart and the hopeless horizontal, the self-centered nature that causes great struggle in our marriage is often because of the temporal versus the eternal battle. And then third, horizontal hope. You see this in 22 and 23. He says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What is Jesus referring to here? He's really speaking to what, he what we talked about last night, the, the vertical. So, so a lack of vertical gaze is, is bright. Like if, if your hopes are horizontal, let's just say you have these great ambitions for your career. You're driven towards it. You're equipping yourself towards it. It's a horizontal pursuit. And as bright as it seems, as great as it seems, as, as much hope as it seems to bring about how it can set you up in your future, because it's horizontal and your eyes are focused on it, it brings darkness into your soul. It's a lack of vertical gaze. That only as we look vertical can light come into our soul. So this misplaced hope or this lack of horizontal hope proverbs 13 says hope deferred makes the heart sick you know who hope is capital h hope god is hope he's our only hope jesus is our hope he is our only hope and when our eyes are on christ that vertical gaze is psalm 121 talks about we actually referenced that in the green room today like i lift my eyes to the mountain it's refuge the picture of the mountain is the Mount Zion. It's the Lord. I lift my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. That vertical gaze brings light into the soul, which gives us the hope we need to live this life in this fallen world. And then a fourth reality of this hopelessly horizontal heart disposition that caused great struggle in marriage is misplaced allegiance. You see this in verse 24. Noah can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And this picture of allegiance of our hearts, it, it can only be devoted to one. Remember we talked Matthew 22, the vertical heart? That our hearts are created with a one vertical relationship capacity. Like I have horizontal capacity for, you know, maybe 10 deep relationships, maybe. 
but I have created by God vertical capacity for one. And, and when, I, when I give the implications of that vertical capacity to something else, first of all, it doesn't work. And second of all, now all of my allegiances are 100% divided. And here's the thing, like, Jesus is so crystal clear in this sermon. Let me read how, here's how Jesus ends the sermon. If you're, if you're trying to grow your church large, this isn't the way you end the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus does it. Here's what he says. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For if the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. You know what Jesus is saying? I'm the only way to salvation. There's no third way. Wide is the gate to destruction. Narrow is the gate through Christ alone that leads to life. And so what, what Jesus is saying it, in that sermon is, uh, is, is very much in tune with what he's saying here in verse 24. You can't serve two masters. So misplaced allegiance is going to bring about great struggle in our vertical hearts, which is going to lead to fallout in our marriages. So that's the first one, hopelessly horizontal and self-centered. The second, second reason that marriages can struggle, failure to leave and cleave. Go to Genesis 2, 24. Genesis 2, 24, right there at the beginning. Genesis 2, 24. This is failure to leave and cleave. This is the first marriage, okay? This is God's institution of marriage right here. Jesus actually teaches from this same perspective. Paul teaches from the same perspective. God is initiating the covenant of marriage right here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this picture of leaving and cleaving, the word leave, okay, when he says shall leave his father and mother, the, the word leave actually means abandon. Like, like to, to leave your father and mother and to go and be so connected and committed to your spouse. And in this context, it literally means to, to go and to meet the needs. Now, not needs in the sense that I was kind of speaking to last night as is dangerous. Like these soul needs that I have are ultimately met in Christ alone. My wife can't meet those and was never created by God to meet those soul needs. That's not what this means. These are needs of like commitment. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to her. I'm, I'm abandoning what I've known as my life before, and I'm going to be committed to taking care of her and her to me. It means to meet these needs and the desires of the spouse. So we put the concerns of the spouse as the higher priority than ours and all others. So here's the picture of marriage, that your spouse should be the primary and permanent relationship over all of the relationships apart from your relationship with Christ Jesus. What, what, what God is saying here in Genesis 24 is that your marriage with your spouse, husband to the wife, wife to the husband, is the most important earthly relationship you should ever have apart from your relationship with Christ Jesus. You wouldn't believe how often I see People in marriage fight to keep other relationships as close to their hearts as their husband or wife should be. And it's easy to pick on dudes with this one, but I've seen women do it too. But, but, but guys, like they've got their bros, they, they got their dudes that they run, they run with, they've been friends for a long time, then they get married and, and those dudes don't like take a back seat, they kind of like stay right neck, neck and neck with the wife. Like that's, that's not okay. These dudes need to kind of fall, fall down the pecking order a bit. And, and if they don't understand that, I don't know how good a friend they actually are. And if they're, they're speaking nay, say against that, that, oh, you're a sellout, bro, then they're not giving you godly counsel. Like what the heart of the Lord is that, that your spouse becomes the, the paramount relationship on earth other than your relationship with Christ. And with women, so often I've seen they, they can't like not talk to their mama. I mean, listen, my wife talks to my mom or her mom all the time. She's a widow, okay? And they talk probably every day. My sister talks to my mom every day, but, but th that can take a really unhealthy turn. 
Like if, if, if she's pouring more of herself out intimacy-wise to her mom than she does with her husband, like that's problematic because she's giving herself over to that relationship in a way that it shouldn't be anymore because of leaving and cleaving. But the, the, the wife and the husband, the, the spouse becomes the most important and um, permanent relationship on earth. And this picture of holding fast, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. That picture of holding fast is to cling to. It's to, to stick to or weld together. Like Paul uses this in Ephesians 5. We'll talk about it tomorrow morning. This picture, um, but, but it's this, this clinging to, this welding together. I, I don't know if you've done any welding, and I, I'm not like a welder, but I've been around welding. When, you, when, you, when you're putting metal together and you, you get the, the blowtorch and then you, you melt you know, the welding rod and it, and it bonds the metal to the metal, that's not easily broken. In fact, you'd have to use a hammer and do some severe damage to break that weld. That's the hold fast. That's a picture of holding fast. You see why like, like marriage it shouldn't be this like very, really open-handed kind of like, yeah, come and go. Let's just see kind of what happens. Our, our, our culture has such a low view of marriage and it goes really all the way back to dating. Like when, when a young man or a young woman at um, our church comes to me and asks me my opinion on dating, I can't chapter and verse them and show them why dating is like unbiblical. I, I can't take them to that chapter or that verse in the scriptures. But man, I can point to all kinds of brokenness in our culture. Here's how our, how, how our culture approaches dating. It's very me-centered. It's like a big old buffet. All you can eat Chinese food buffet. I'm going to taste a little of this. Try a little bit of this. I'm actually tired of this. So we're going to go over here. Oh, you show me that in scripture. And, and, and the damage that that does to the other end, <laughs> like when you give yourself over, over and over, the damage that that does to the soul, it's like it's not a neutral thing. Like your soul didn't just glaze over and just isn't affected when you give yourself over to a person and then they move on or you move on and that happens over and over it's a self-centered perspective that our culture has. And when that invades the marriage, the holding fast picture is threatened mightily. And this picture of holding fast, it's from God to us. It's actually referencing God's covenantal faithfulness. You see this in Deuteronomy 10, 20. You can write that down and look it up later. You see this in Proverbs 2, 17. You see it in Malachi 2, 14. This holding fast is a picture of God's covenantal faithfulness to us. That the covenant is the Lord's first and foremost. That he makes a covenant with us. And he's a promise-keeping God ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And God views covenants as unbelievably important. In Genesis 15, you see God make a covenant with Abraham. And it's, it's, a, it's a really great story. Like, it's, it's the, like God's promise that he's going to build a great nation to Abraham. And Abraham's like, how will I know? And, and, and God says, like, and I'm just paraphrasing it. You can go back and read Genesis 15. But God tells Abraham, he's like, okay, I want you to take these different animals and I want you to cut them in half. And what that would have meant to Abraham would have been like, oh, it's contract time. Because the way that you made a contract with another person in those times was you would take an animal, cut it in half, and then the two people making the contract would walk between the, the two animal halves. And the, the, the picture was this. Like, may it be to me as one of these animals if I break contract. Boy, that, that gets some stuff done. I don't think a notary pulls it off. That gets stuff done. And he tells Abraham, cut these animals up and, and, and place them. And then God caused a great sleep to fall over Abraham. You know who went through the animals? God did. He said, may it be on me if I break this covenant. You know who it fell on? Jesus. You see it? So this holding fast, like the husband and wife, this is a shadow of that. You see why marriage is so sacred? Because it's a shadow of the covenant-keeping promises of our God to us through Jesus Christ. Shouldn't be frail. Shouldn't be like, mm, kind of over it. Kind of tired of it. Because as if God's ever said that about us. He has every right to. Bit bored with Lee. He's still struggling with that. He's never said that. He's so committed to the salvation that he's produced in you through Jesus Christ, that he promises to finish the work that he started. And his mercies are new every morning. 
Every morning, the fact that we have breath and life right now is his grace on our lives. And not only has he saved us with the gospel, he strengthens us day by day as we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. You see, holding fast, he is held as tight to us as tight could be. Husbands, hold fast to your wife. Wife, hold fast to your husband. In this picture of one flesh, Paul talks about this in Ephesians as well. We'll talk about it tomorrow morning at length, but from the perspective of Genesis, this picture of one flesh, what does it mean? It, it, it's, it's reemphasizing everything he's already said. And no other relationship on earth apart from Christ should take precedent above the husband-wife relationship. And let me just be very clear about the standard that God is setting for marriage here. This is very important. Here's the standard for marriage, okay? This is the first marriage. God's establishing the covenant of marriage from his heart as a covenant-keeping God to Adam and Eve. Here's the covenant of marriage. One man, one woman under covenant with God, that is biblical marriage. Our, Our culture would say many other things. And there's three dynamics the scriptures speak to as to the the inworkings and the outworkings of marriage. And I don't have time to unpack them all, but I'm going to reference them. The first is the ceremonial. So we we love the ceremonies, right? I'm sure there's been weddings here. You know, like you go to a Christian wedding um, or or even just a family member and the ceremony happens and people are all excited and people are wearing their best clothes and there's a great banquet and celebration that's going to happen after the vows are said and the, the husband and wife share vows together, share vows in front of the covenant community and under the Lord, his covenant to them, their covenant with one another. That's the ceremonial piece. There's also the judicial piece. Yeah, we could go justice of the peace right now and get this thing done. Like the Lord actually speaks to that in the scriptures, that there is a judicial aspect of, of marriage. But, but what makes marriage marriage according to God's heart is this right here. And so, so, so the government can do whatever they want with marriage. They can, they can make it legal with, between a dude and an animal. Men and men, women and women, they, the government can do all kinds of things with the institution of marriage, but if it doesn't line up with this verse here, it's not biblical marriage. This is the heart of the Lord. I mean, and, 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 and I, there's a reason that marriage is so assaulted in our culture. If it's the, the, shining, the shining glimpse of the gospel of Jesus Christ, why wouldn't Satan come after it? The holding fast that just screams Jesus to a lost and dying world. Of course he's going to come after it. It doesn't mean that we change our views on what the Lord says marriage is. And so it, with, with as much grace as I can, because I, I realize where I'm at. I, I realize where, what, what you guys battle against and, and, and the, the sanctity of marriage and, and it's under assault in ways here that, that I don't even see where I live. I can see that. Like, and with, all, with all sensitivity and, 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 and carefulness that I can, like, like, like the same-sex attraction, that whole wrestle, there's so much grace and love for that struggle through the gospel. There's so much grace and love. But, but here's what I, would, here's what I would, would plead with all of us to consider. It's a sin like any other sin, and the church has brutalized how they've ministered to that struggler. And it's so sad for me. I've counseled dozens and dozens and dozens of men and women who have struggled with same-sex attraction and seen them find victory in Christ Jesus as they learn to struggle well. It's always problematic, though, with any sin when we harden our heart to it and say, I want this more than you, Jesus. That's always problematic. I don't care what the sin is. Always problematic. And so, so what we as Christians believe is that, that we, we don't embrace sin. We run from sin because we know we're prone to sin. But we, in our sin struggles, we repent and we faith often as we run towards the cross of Christ. We don't give in to our inclinations. We don't give in to our bents. We don't give in to our struggles. We run to the cross of Christ knowing that through Christ alone we find cleansing and grace. We don't embrace them. I mean, like I'm a one woman man, but man, like I got, I got some sick desires in my heart when the flesh is ruling. So if I just give into to those, those desires, does that mean I get to go after every woman that I'm drawn to? By no means. I'm drawn to them though. Shouldn't I just give into that compulsion? Because isn't that who I am? Well, in your brokenness it is, and we need Jesus to deliver me from that. It's my only hope. 
We don't give ourselves over to an inclination. We run to Christ who frees us and heals us of all our sin, all our shame, and all our struggle. So you've got this leaving. You've got this holding fast. You've got this one flesh. It's this beautiful picture of the two becoming one. It's it's this, this gluing, this cementing, this welding together, but then maintaining their unique characteristics. Um. One of the things that, it's not too late to do this in your marriage if you haven't done this, but my father, um, man, he's, he's the man in my life. Um, such a good man. And uh, it's, it's moments like what I'm about to tell you that make him such a, a dear, dear person in my life. Um, when I got married in 2005, um, I was graduating, I was supposed to graduate that weekend I ended up delaying it because you don't ever graduate from graduate school and get married in the same weekend. (laughs) Don't do it. I I tried to do it and didn't do it, so I just stuck to marriage that weekend. Yeah, we'll graduate another weekend. Let's just get married. And um, He took me out to the French Quarter. Um, I loved New Orleans. Um, It's much more than Bourbon Street. (laughs) Um, A lot of good food, a lot of art, um, just a lot of culture. Um, and if you're a foodie like me, which, I mean, I would have loved Portland in another day, okay, for the, for the awesome food I've always heard about that was in Portland, but that's New Orleans in many ways, and so we were down in the French Quarter, and we were just kind of walking around and went to um, have lunch together, and, and he, um, <laughs> this is such a hard story to tell, he set me down, and he said, um, he said, Lee, like, we're so excited for you, you know. We've been praying for, for this day for you since you were a little boy. Uh, and then he began to share specific things that they had prayed for that my wife would be to me, that they believed Andrea was going to be for me. So it was like kind of my whole life flashing <laughs> before my eyes. And then he said something that really threw me off. He said, Lee, you've always been welcome at our house. And man, when we, when we go home, like it's like, because we're all foodies, like we just hang in the kitchen and we cook together. It's just so fun um, when my family gets together. So like going home is like, like precious to me. He said, like, you, you're always welcome at the house. You've always been welcome. Um, but now you're going you're gonna to marry Andrea. And some things need to change, like, you're never welcome at our house the way that you were. You can come and visit. But you can't, you're not welcome the way that you've always been welcomed. And my, my, something broke in my heart. Um, I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, you've you got to be committed to her now. She's your home. Like, we're here for you. Come visit. We'll come visit you. And, and, and it'll, it'll be great. But, like, you need to shift. You need to shift towards her. And, like, broke my heart. But then, like, all of a sudden, I was like, okay. Okay. Well, my wife, when my mother-in-law, um, when my wife was 18, her, um, her dad died of um, a, brain, a brain aneurysm. And so she had an older sister who had already left, and then she had two younger brothers. And so she was going into, um, she was going to be a freshman at LSU. And um, so her brothers were, I mean, they were, they were young, and, and so a lot of taking care of her mom fell on my wife. And, and rightfully so. She felt a strong obligation for and towards her mom. Again, rightfully so. Well, the conversation my dad had with me, which broke my heart, but set me up, she didn't ever have such a conversation with her mom. And so we get married, and I'm like, I'm family, see you later. Like, you're my, you're my family now. You're my family now, babe. And, and she still had this connection with her mom. And, and it created some significant struggle and, and it kind of came to a head we were visiting her mom one weekend and and it was just assumed that like and don't take this the wrong way but when she would go home from college to visit her mom she would always sleep in the bed with her mom and so her mom came and knocked on the door one night and said hey you gonna come sleep with me i mean we're just married and remember the whole passive aggressive thing i can't pretend i responded well i went all self-righteous on her i was like well i lived in cleve I didn't say that, but man, I held it in my heart. I got bitter. 
And, and then just one day, like, we were just butting heads, and she's like, what are you, are you against my mom? Like, don't you know what the scriptures say about widows? I mean, she's kind of bringing all, she's bringing her burden to me and then trying to explain and articulate why she feels such a commitment to her mom and all. I'm just hurt and embarrassed because I've waited my whole marriage, to, my whole life to be married, and now my wife won't even sleep in the same bed with me. Right? You see it? And I told her the story about my dad. I'd never told her. I said, let me tell you what my dad did. And I just told her what, what I just shared with y'all, and, and her face changed. Her face changed, and she, right then and there, she said, okay, I understand. I understand, but like, will you help me take care of my mom if something happens to her? I said, absolutely, absolutely, but I want us to fight for this. Listen, if you've never done that to hold fast to each other, it's never too late. You can do that now. It doesn't mean like, there's always dynamics that you have to pay attention to. Like, we will most likely take my mother-in-law in one day. And I'm glad to do it. We're setting our house up in such a way where we can have a mother-in-law type situation in case we need to bring her in. But, but, like, but not at the cost of the holding fast. Hold fast. Don't pretend that it's easy. But, but do you know who fuels that call? The gospel does. Because God holds fast to us through Jesus Christ. You know that God never loses his sheep? He never has. Never lost one of his sheep. He holds fast to us. And so with that gospel strength, God can equip me through the cross of Christ to hold fast to my wife. And this beautiful gospel idea that we see here in Genesis 2, 24, it flies in the face of what our culture believes. Um, our culture pursues compatibility. Our, our culture pursues chemistry. Here's what I mean. So... Both of my grandparents ended up being married for 60 years. Um, and I remember, like, on my dad's side, my granny and granddad, um, they were first-generation Christians. And they came out of horrific brokenness. Um, my granny was, oh, man, just lots of brokenness. And the Lord saved them. And, and they, they kind of, like, took the machete and chopped through the thick jungle for, for the rest of us Lewises. Um, and I remember when my, my grandma started, she had a form of Alzheimer's, and she started to decline, and it was so hard to watch that. If you've seen that, it's just gut-wrenching, and what was equally as hard for me was to watch my grandfather have to watch his wife. Like, it was just so hard to watch. But what was so fascinating to me was to see, like, this love that he's shared with her over these years, like, at that point, he wasn't getting anything in return, but his love didn't change for her at all. I was like, man, that, that's not compatibility. That's something deeper. That's something way deeper. That, that's a love that's been carved in his soul through Christ that, that is for her regardless of what he gets from her. I, I, still, I still do Valentine's Day's cards because I'm afraid I'll get in trouble if I don't. I'm, seven, I'm, I'm nearly 17 years into marriage and like, there's no debate. You're getting a Valentine's Day card. Because that's going to go bad if you don't. Like, there's still some motives in me that are like, yeah, you better do that, Lee. You should do that. Now, it's not just all free and, and pure out of just clean gospel love from my heart to her because of what I may or may not get back. And, and when you approach the, the, the picture of marriage um, compatibility-based or chemistry-based, you get away very quickly you shift away from this beautiful piece of covenantal love. And so things like chemistry are emphasized more than anything. Like both my grandparents, they had a lot of chemistry in the marriage. And I'm convinced it happened year 45. <laughs> I'm convinced. I don't think they started off with a lot of chemistry. But as the Lord mingled their souls together, well, you talk about chemistry... Oh, here's another one, compatibility. You know that men and women aren't compatible? <laughs> you know, the, the only person I'm actually compatible with is me. I'm really good with me. If you never say a word, we might get along. <laughs> compatibility? What? Men and women aren't compatible. And so when you, when, you, when you shift away from the covenantal peace that Genesis is talking about here, you, you miss the beauty of the, this this complementing of one another, which is what we're about to talk about with the role of men and women, where, 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 where I, I lack in some areas, not in a bad way, just that God didn't create me that way, my wife doesn't, and, and where she lacks in some areas, not in a bad way, 
Just because God didn't create her that way, I don't. And the Lord, the, he, he mingles our souls together and, and we complement one another. And God uses those pieces to, to backfill areas and strengthen areas in us that he's using as part of this beautiful mystery of marriage. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. All right, third. Third reason marriages struggle. And I'm going to go through this one rather quickly, but gender, gender role confusion. Gender role confusion. And where, where does gender role confusion come from? Well, sometimes it's just already formed worldviews. So we, we all bring our story into a marriage, right? So things like family of origin, that's real. If I, if I had time to unpack my grandmother's story of, of abuse that she grew up in, like she brought all that baggage into marriage. So she was, I think she was one of 12, and she was the only girl. She was the youngest. Boys in the house, brothers and half-brothers, alcoholics in the home, and every one of them sexually assaulted her at different points. And then one of them came to his senses and realized this ain't right and took her out of that when she was 14 or 15. So she had a lot of wounds, and I've counseled sexual abuse. It's horrific. And the wounds she had from that, the depression she struggled with at different periods was substantial because of those early wounds that she experienced in her home. And she brought that into marriage to my grandfather. And, and, and oh, the Lord used my grandfather's gentle disposition to nurture and cherish her as the gospel was healing those broken spots in her. And it took years and decades. She was already saved, but, but just for those fruits to be worked into those hard-to-reach hurts. So family of origin, current cultural norms. So if you let the culture inform how you see marriage and how you preach marriage, you'll be preaching anti-gospel rather quickly. Because everything, I don't pretend that everybody in this room like, likes what I'm saying, but man, I, and I say this with all respect, like this is the Lord speaking in Genesis. This is his heart. Like, bring that wrestle, bring that frustration to him. But, like, the, the culture in 40 years is going to look even different than it does now. And as bad as it is now, it's probably going to look worse. Then we can't let the culture dictate what we preach. We preach Christ and him crucified. And that informs how we engage with the lost and the hurting and the broken culture. But it doesn't change how we see anything, especially marriage. So things like observations and experiences of other marriages, things like abuse, all kinds of things. The already formed worldview can greatly influence gender role confusion. So if a, if a um, daughter had an overbearing, abusive father, how do you think that's going to affect how she sees her husband? So my wife's dad, he, he fled from Cuba when he was a little boy. So he had machismo, that's what they call it. Machismo, it's like it's full of pride. And he was a very abusive man before he came to faith in Christ. He was verbally abusive, um, emotionally abusive, sometimes physically abusive, mainly with their mother. So in, in some ways, like, he came to faith later in life before he died by God's grace. And he changed for sure, but the damage had been done. A lot of damage. So, so my wife, like, intense emotions, man, it's hard for her. And, and, and the Lewises, like, like if, if we ever had conflict in our home, dad would call a family meeting. Loved them. And I'm being sarcastic right now. <laughs> I appreciate them now as a father, but they were awful. Like, I'm just like, and my sister had a real rebellious streak, and she loves Jesus now. She's this beautiful woman. But like that rebellious streak, I was older than her, but when I would be home for summers in college, like that's when her rebellious streak was really coming out. And we would have family meetings like every friggin' night. It felt like. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't even do anything. This is her issue. I'm like 21 now. Why do I got to be in the family meeting? And my dad would give me the glare and I set my rear end down. But, but we bring all of these things into marriage and it greatly influences how we see things. But we're called to have a biblical worldview of marriage. And Genesis 1.26 teaches that men and women were created with complete and absolute equality. Do you hear me? Complete and absolute equality. Tim Keller says it this way. I think he actually says it in that book. That men and women were equally made in the image of God. Men, 
listen to this. That as image bearers, I, I, I'm like, I got to be careful because I have a whole other sermon I could preach on this concept of image bearers. But what God did when he stamped his image onto man and woman, he didn't do with anything else in creation. He imprints himself on to us. And as men and women, they're equally made in this image of God, equally image bearers, equally blessed and equally given dominion over the earth so that they can, in full participation, carry, a, carry out God's mandate and plan to build civilization and culture together. Like Eve wasn't junior varsity, okay? She wasn't. Full of dignity, full of beauty as God created her to be. In fact, like, when, when Adam said, like, woman, like when God gives her Eve, He's like, woman doesn't do it justice. That's just a word to us. He's like, oh my goodness. She didn't say that about him. <laughs> and, and I'm sure she was just drawn to Adam. I'm sure he was a beast, right? But like, he was like, he was staggered by her. Co-heirs, co-image bearers. 1 Corinthians 11.3 teaches that the relationship of the father and the son is the pattern for the relationship of the husband and the wife. That the son submits to the father's headship with free, voluntary, and joyful eagerness, not out of coercion or inferiority. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. Like Jesus didn't submit to the will of the father begrudgingly. Like he didn't. He was under no compulsion. And he was under no obligation. Like he left the expanse and the glory of heaven and, and, and narrowed himself into the form of, of human with all the angst and pains that come with being human and all the frailties and limitations that come with being human and then narrowed himself even further to the point of death under no compulsion, under no obligation. He did it out of his love for the Father. So, so when God calls for submission, and, and I believe mutual submission in the body of Christ is a beautiful and good thing. Like, I submit to you as a brother. I submit to you as a sister. You submit to me as a brother, as a sister, because we're for each other. And we're, we're mutually submitting to one another as we look to Christ together. When, when there's submission ever talked about in the Scriptures, it's always pointed to the submission of Christ to the will of the Father. So as husbands are called to submit to God in a specific way going into marriage, it's a shadow of the gospel. When wives are called to submit to the husband, it's, it's, it's a shadow of the gospel. Like our culture wants to make this like a, like a brutal thing, like you're telling women to do what? No, like it's, 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 it's a shadow of the gospel. What an honor. What a great honor to be able to, 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 to stumble through and try to, to be what Christ perfectly was to the Father. And, and, and husbands in the same way, like submitting to God. Like there's this beautiful Beautiful submission amongst the Godhead. C.S. Lewis calls it the dance. I think it's in Mere Christianity he talks about it. Like the, the dance of the, the, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That, that the Father is greatly pleased with the Son. And the Son submits to the Father. And the Spirit testify, testifies to the Son. And there's this beautiful, beautiful inworking together amongst the Godhead as they're submitted to one another. Like, submission's not this gross word. Like, God himself displays beautiful submission even in the Godhead. There's the role of the husband. You were given a resource called Portrait of a Godly Husband. That's just like, that's a job description for, for you, brothers. And, and don't think of it as a moral obligation. Think of it as a spiritual act of worship to the Lord. And what I love about how God set up the roles of marriage is... I think some of the heartbreaking situations that I counsel, and it's nearly always with a, a believing woman who's married to an unbelieving husband, it's so hard. It's so hard. I've got a woman right now that I'm counseling at our church, um, and she, she's just a sweet woman. Um, me and her and her advocate, we, we've spent lo a lot of time together. They were, they were living up in Michigan. Uh, it was about the time we moved back to Texas, and her husband moved them down. He came ahead of them. He took some big IT job, like Silicon Valley's moving to Austin. It's troubling. Um, but um, he took some big IT job and moved ahead of them. 
And really what was happening is he had met a man online already. Took a job and began this relationship with this guy. And then moves his family. She didn't know anyone. Two kids, actually, excuse me, three kids. She gets down there with the kids, finishing school, comes in the summer, and he decides to tell her, oh yeah, I don't want to be married anymore. I found my true love. And she's just been at our church ever since. Like at a church, she didn't know a single person. I mean, like this woman has scraped by. And, and, and we plead for his salvation all the time. But he won't have anything to do with me. Nothing to do with the church. Yet claims to be a Christ follower. And, and, and yet to see what the Lord's doing in her heart. It's so difficult. It's so hard for her to be this single mother. But you know who's become her husband? Like the Lord has. Like it's Isaiah 55. The Lord is her husband. And she is taken care of. And so there's this glaring deficiency of the role of the husband with her kids. But, but it's actually not a deficiency because God has now become her husband and her kids are being drawn into that beautiful marriage between her and the father. And God's using other men and women in the church to come around her kids and nurture and love them where the father has punted on all those responsibilities. You see how the Lord backfills it? It's beautiful what the Lord does, even though we break things up and it gets destroyed when we touch it. God can still move in and work these roles, even in situations where it's not the way it should be. But the role of the husband, he's the leader. He's meant to be the servant leader. Mark 10, 45 talks about he's not a dictator. Husband, if you lead with an iron fist, you need to repent to the Lord and humble yourself. When has God ever manhandled you Huh? Like, God could thump us and smite us. When has he ever put his thumb on you? Now, he's afflicted me, but he's brought me low. He's wounded me to give me more of Jesus, but he's never abused or destroyed me. Husband, if you're a dominant dictator in your home, repent and humble yourself and run to the cross of Christ so that you can be gentle and lowly and a servant leader to your wife. And this authority and this leadership, it's radically changed and redefined to be a servant leader that dies to himself so that they can love and serve their wife. Like getting to look to both of my grandfathers and my father like, I think I'm kind of starting to experience it as my kids are getting older, um, what I remember seeing in them so often. Like, I'll give you an example, like on Christmas. I'm not sure that like my granddad or my dad ever got like a gift. I'm sure they did, but man, we got hooked up. My mom always got hooked up. Like, like I just looked to my dad and it was like his, his, his desires were kind of always checked at the door. Like his ambitions, his dreams were always kind of checked out the door. In fact, he, he, he's got his degree in horticulture. Like my mom's a landscape architect. He's got a degree in horticulture. And he had these, I mean, he would love, like, he, he's such a nerd. He's already texted me. I'm like, are there fir trees there in Oregon? And I've heard there's some <laughs> lovely Japanese maples. And I'm like, dad. And then he's saying the Latin name to me. I'm like, stop, just stop, dad. And he doesn't talk that way. He's a manly man. He's, he's, he's firm in the Lord, but he, he is such a gentle man. Um, but he... Um, it's like he was always checking his desires at the door like husbands. Be the servant leader that looks out for the wife's interests first and looks out for the kids' interests next. And if there's anything left over, man, go enjoy. But chances are there's not going to be much left over. You're always kind of riding on E. My mentor used to tell me like, and this was good for me as a pastor because like I pour myself out with people. You know, and I hear their stories and their brokenness. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I'm what they call a crier, right? <laughs> I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for it. God made me high in mercy. Mercy just close to my heart. Um, movies um, with a redemptive theme, you're going to see tears. I got tissues right here in my pocket right now. Um, but the weight of people's hurts, like, man, it, it can hit me hard. And the brokenness that people see and that they have to walk through. And it can drain me. And what my mentor used to always tell me is like, you've been doing ministry all day long. Your most important ministry is at home. How are you going to go home and, ta and tackle that when you're so tapped out? And so if you knew my friend, he's just this older man, just great man of the Lord. He's just got all this energy. Like, it's like he's always on speed or something. And I know he's not. It's just the Holy Spirit. 
And he's just always so amped up. And he's like, let me tell you a prayer to pray, Lee. Bro, bro. He always says, bro. Hey, bro, let me tell you a prayer. Like on your way home, you're just tapped out. You're empty. And you, you turn that radio off. Turn it off, Lee. He was like, no, turn it off. I'm like, I'm not in my truck. Turn it off. <laughs> okay, turn the radios off. <laughs> Jeez, you'd love this guy. Turn it off. And you drive home and you just sit in silence. You talk to the Lord and you ask for the Lord to fill you up with his mighty strength and make you like a lion to devour your family. I'm like, that's an odd image. <laughs> it's an odd image, but I'm, I'm going to go with where I think you're going. And so often I'm like, turn that radio off. Like to this day, I turn that radio off. I'm like, Lord, I am so exhausted, so burdened today, so much brokenness. But you're good. Your mercies are new this morning. They've, they've steadied me today. Like, give me the strength to go and just love and serve my family. I wish I did that every day. The day I don't is the day I go and fight for my kingdom at home. And there's a lot to fight for when I need me some peace. I can start yelling at the kids. And my kids are scared of me because I'm firm. Like, I've set some standards, and they, man, they know when dad is serious. So I can give the look just like my dad gave me. And they know it's like toe the line time. And I can create a false peace and get people to cooperate with my kingdom. And you would walk in and you would look at it and you'd be like, man, you have such an like, orderly home. But if I've done it in my own strength to fight for my kingdom, because I'm fighting for my ways, it looks appealing. It looks right. But it's not gospel. It's not gospel. Husbands, die to self and serve your wives. The husband's a learner. 1 Peter 3, 7 talks about this, that the husband is commanded to understand his wife. Again, men and women um, aren't compatible, and, and I think that understanding is a work in process. Um, w- women are described as the weaker vessel, and, and that's, that's been greatly abused, that, the misunderstanding of that. The picture of the, w- the wife being the weaker vessel isn't, it isn't a flaw in any way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the way that God's made her in a way where she has an emotional capacity and a sensitivity to herself um, that opens her up to all kinds of compassion and tenderness that don't come near as easy to dudes. Dudes are dense at times. I mean, I, I see it with my wife and our kids. She's so nurturing with them. I'm like, I'm like how are you like, so patient right now? Because I just kind of want to strangle them. And she's just so nurturing with them. And she, she's able to get into my boys' hearts in ways that me, the biblical counselor, can't even touch. Because of this sensitivity. But then in, in that sensitivity, there are certain dynamics that she interacts with that I don't have to interact with. Like she has emotional highs and lows that are all over the place. I'm sorry, women. You got the short end of the stick on that fall, that part of the fall. And, and, and it, can, it, can, it can cause a woman to be up and down in ways that, that, that a, for a dude are just maddening. But you know what the husband's called to do? To be patient and enter into those vulnerable areas and not figure her out, but be patient with her and gracious with her. Again, I don't do that near as often as I should. But, but here's the picture to put gospel on that. You know how up and down we are? <laughs> And how slow to anger and abounding in love the Lord is with you and I. Yeah, he's so patient. Like one of the great attributes of God in the scriptures is that he's long-suffering. Praise the Lord. That the highs and lows of our life, God's never at the mercy of them. He's so gentle and careful as he ministers to us through Christ. And that the husband is the lover. That the true test of masculinity requires sacrificial dying to self and the redemptive good for his wife. The husband is to portray God, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow. But then there's the role of the wife, the follower. She's um, a follower of her husband. She's submissive to her husband. She willingly lines up under her husband. It's actually a military term. When you see it in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3, that that she willingly lines up under her husband, and that the church submits to Christ in everything, Therefore, the wife submitting to her husband in everything, it's no longer seen as daunting, debilitating, devaluing, especially when the husband imitates the servant leader role of Christ. When the husband's abusing that role, and we'll probably get this question, 
and, and, and we can interact with it because this is hard. Like what if the wife is under an abusive man? Is she supposed to submit to him in all things? If the husband's leading the woman in some type of sinful way or some type of sinful endeavor, um, the woman is to submit to Christ above that because that is evil before the Lord. She does not have to s- submit to a man who's hell-bent on walking them into sin. I've seen men try to lead their wives into adulterous relationships so that as men they could benefit from their wives' sin and a woman in no way would be under any obligation to submit to that sinful. That is wrong and evil before the Lord. So I use an extreme example to describe a dynamic that you may be very familiar with. But ultimately, looking to Christ to strengthen her resolve as she follows her husband. She becomes the greatest fan and interceder for her husband. Like, like um, ladies, look at me for a second. Um, like, there's probably so many things about your husband that you long to see thrive even more. And, 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 and mo- by and large, my guess is that you're right for it. Like, you, you want to see him thrive. You see these areas where maybe he struggles and that maybe he's not leading spiritually as, as well as he could. Or maybe he, he doesn't initiate prayer as much as he could. Or maybe he's not as open and transparent with other brothers or with you as maybe he could. And you long to see him thrive in those areas. It's not wrong. But don't become the third person of the Trinity. Be an intercessor for him in those areas more than a nag. And there will be those moments where the Lord has you speak the truth in love to him because he's a brother in Christ. And he needs to be stirred up towards righteousness, towards holiness. But you've prayed your guts out for so long that when that conversation happens, the spirit of God is all over it. Because you're not nagging. You're for your brother. You're for your husband. Be your husband's greatest intercessor. And the, the wife is called to be a finisher, a fitting, suitable helper. Genesis 2.18 talks about this. The Hebrew word for helper is used many times in the scripture in relation to God. And when God's called the helper for the woman to be called a helper, she's being called with one of the same attributes that is associated with God the Father. That's a pretty cool honor. I mean, the way that my wife helps me, guys, like my wife doesn't just backfill my deficiencies. She like over and above passes me in my deficiencies. Like, and in so many ways, she comes and helps me in just deep, profound ways. And then, and then there's ways where the Lord uses me to help her. Like she's very law-based in her mind. Like she, she'll, she, she'll remember a sin from years ago and think like, oh my gosh, do I need to call him and make it right? And Satan will beat her up on it. And the Lord's used me to help her be free in the gospel. And then there's areas where, man, I just can neglect certain things and, and I won't lead the way that I need to lead. And she'll so gently come alongside me and encourage me and spur me on without speaking down to me. And to be the helper, it's meant to make up what is lacking in him, to be that strong source of strength alongside him. And then the wife is to portray the church, being subject in everything, cooperating with the goals that the Lord has for her and respecting him as the church does Christ. Even if your husband's not acting in a respect-worthy way, respect him as you would respect the Lord because he is an image bearer. I think one of the big damaging things of marriage is, man, when you get at odds and you start to grow apart and bitterness begins to work its way into your heart, you stop looking at each other as image bearers and you look at each other with disdain. And, and here's the thing, like, and I said this last night, it's so important to remember that the Lord is, the Lord is so committed to your salvation. He's so committed to your sanctification. And, and, and my wife, as much as I love her, he loves her more. And, and, and he has is, he is given me the privilege to steward his daughter. Boy, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? And then same with me, that it's a privilege, a great call and honor that my wife has been given from God to steward his son in me. Like, do you take that call seriously or do you neglect it? Um, I'm going to close with this story. There's a couple at our church, sweet young couple. Um, he grew up in the church. His dad um, is actually a pastor um, in a, in a um, town near where we live. Um, somewhat of a legalistic setting 
Uh, good doctrine at this church, really good doctrine, but like kind of law-based. The gospel's there, but it's not the central thing. And so he kind of grew up in this religious setting. His wife is from um, Indiana, near Indianapolis. She's a first-generation Christian. And she grew up, and, and you would just, and she would say it, because she has said it, like she grew up white trash. Um, dad was um, a, a womanizer, cheated on her mom many times, and they ended up divorcing as a result of it. Drugs were always close, um, and, and she, she grew up in that setting, very chaotic, dark setting, and the Lord saved her. Um, you know, she's, she's still got some of the fumes of that life pretty close to her. When she, when she sees what she feels like is an injustice, she goes into fight mode. And a year ago right now, I get a call from him saying like, man, we really need some help. Like, can you come over? And so I, I went over there and nothing really could have prepared me for what they were about to lay out to me. I mean, uh, married just like a couple years. They have a little baby, little baby Judah. It's got downs. They've been through a lot. And, and this young man had, had, had come home, and, and she had been questioning some things about some decisions he was making. He had become increasingly distant in the home and, and not near as trustworthy on a number of matters. And she already had trust issues from what she would see with her dad and how he, she saw her mom get used and abused by her father. So she, she always wants to put the fists up. So just that's the dynamic at the home. And then the reason for such a disconnect came out. He had been in a relationship with another young man from his work for months. And he'd had this secret struggle with same-sex attraction his whole life and never told anyone. His whole life. He'd been a, a, a preacher's son, grew up in the church, never told his soul, but it acted out on that many times over. Man, the, the, that world, just so you know, like where people just, just giving themselves over through Craigslist, it's awful. It's awful what goes on. And he had been pulled into that life with secret sin. So he's got this beautiful wife. He's got this little baby with downs. And now this? I mean, what do you tell me? A year later, what do you think, what, what, what do you think they are statistically? I don't think it's going to work out. And, and, and we're in their apartment. And I'm like, she's, she's fisted up. And she's wanting to know she, all the what for's. And, and the, the where's, and the, she's, she's wanting every chronological detail she could possibly get. And I, I get it. I can't even fault her. And many of the things she wanted to know, like there'd be a time and a place for him to answer those questions. But he was hardening and hardening and hardening. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just went deep into my soul and just said, this is a battle against something spiritual, not flesh and blood. And so I, I said, hey, girl, let's, let's go downstairs for a second. Let's go downstairs. So we went out and we took a walk. And I said, listen, like, you're asking lots of questions that I think are fair game, okay? But, like, I need you to look right at me. And I stopped her and I, I, I grabbed her shoulder and said, I need you to look right at me. Like, this is a battle for his soul right now. Do you see that? This is a battle for his soul. And her whole disposition changed. She's like, okay. I said, there'll be a time and a place to draw this out. But I'm afraid we're about to lose him. So we went back up there, and, and um, it was me, her, and him, and I'm pretty sure Satan was in the room. And he was hardening and hardening, hardening. I looked right at him. I said, listen, bro, like if you give yourself over to this, you have no idea the, where the bottom of this rabbit hole goes. You have no idea. And I'm pleading with him. We're pleading with him. He confesses Christ. And now he's saying, like, I'm not even sure I believe any of that. And we pleaded with him. And that night they went and stayed at his parents' house. And then all night the wife and the dad prayed scripture over him. And they warred over him that night. He came to faith that night. He came to faith in Jesus Christ that night. And for the last year, we're like starting from scratch. Starting from scratch. And it's like now he's got the spirit of God in him. Oh, that's a game changer. But you know, like the Lord's now coming after lies he's believed his whole life. Because he never had a rock-solid foundation in Christ. He never understood the implications of the gospel. He was always trying to find meaning in how some dude would treat him. 
And he always had these bents and inclinations towards same-sex attraction. But, 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 but he's hearing at church that, that homosexuality is of the devil and they're all going to go to hell. And he wrestled and he kept it private. But now he's in the light. And the Lord's saved him and he's now seeing that in Christ, he's a new creation. And he's not defined by those struggles. And in and, and her, like all this abuse that she saw growing up, like the Lord's coming after those control issues. He's coming after all those hurts and those wounds and, and everything in her always wants to fight for herself. And in fighting for herself, she fails to believe the gospel in those moments to believe that Jesus has already fought for her. And so now she's believing the gospel that she already believed in a far deeper way. And it's so beautiful to watch this sweet couple minister to one another. To the point where they just had a baby shower for their second baby that was born this week. And their family came in. And my wife was there. And one of her relatives came up to my wife. She said, I just had to meet the woman who had helped my daughter-in-law so much. She said, thank you. Like, we're blown away by what the Lord seems to be doing. And this is woman's not a Christian. We're blown away by, we, we, can't, we can't make sense of this because everything in our family marriage-wise has always been such a train wreck and like, this should have ended. It, like, their marriage is now preaching the gospel to her whole family because of what Jesus did in their hearts. Beauty from ashes. Like, the commitment, the covenantal commitment that the Lord has towards you through Christ Jesus is unbreakable. And in marriage, we get to participate and share in that beautiful gospel reality. Let's pray. Father God, um, thank you for your covenantal love for us. a love that we don't deserve, a commitment that we don't deserve, a faithfulness from you that we don't deserve. And yet, it's who you are. You're trustworthy. You, you don't sin. You can't lie. Your word is your word. And it's unshakable. And so we thank you that you initiated a covenant with us one of the great themes in the scripture is that you're a promise keeping God and, 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 and everything points towards Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of that covenant. And this, this radiance of Christ that, that, you've, that you've extended to us to honor your covenant with us that we might have life, that we might have salvation. What love is this? So amazing so undeserved yet so freely given from you to us. And we have this beautiful call of marriage, the institute of marriage that you invented to illustrate the beauties of this covenant where a man will come together with a woman and the two will become one flesh and they will be married in covenant with one another under covenant with you and it is just this beautiful picture of the gospel. Might we not neglect that? Might we submit ourselves to the beauties of it over and over and, and be servants and blessing one another and ministering to one another, be great intercessors for one another as husbands and wives and, and, and be the agent of grace and the agent of change through Christ that you called us to be in each other's lives. The world is watching that they may see the hope of Christ in the marriages that we live out weak, Lord. We won't be perfect. We'll struggle. Help us to be so good, though, Lord, at repentance and brokenness, running back to the cross of Christ over and over, putting our faith and allegiance back there over and over so that we might walk in the ways of Christ and love and serve our wife and love and serve our husband. We need your help. We're weak, but you are strong. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.